Okay, uh, welcome to the colloquium. Um, today we're very happy to have Olga Vieri from the University of Mars. Olivia, Olivia got her PhD at the ETH, and I will not attempt to pronounce the name. And then the postdoc at Harvard. Mm -hmm. Before going to the University of Michigan, uh, where she is now an associate professor. The, uh, she will give us a talk today on the Einstein equations and gravitational waves. And it's very nice to have you. Thank you very much. Um, thanks a lot for inviting me. It's a pleasure to come to this university, Ohio State. <laughs> And uh, I made a joke that I didn't bring my Go Blue hat today. <laughs> so it's really a pleasure to be here. And so, as we said, we're going to talk about Einstein equations, and it's going to be a geometric analytic talk, but with a lot of motivation from physics. So I want to convey some ideas from physics and also the latest observations of gravitational waves that took place in 2015, and explain what beautiful mathematical problems are there. So. Just to say, well, there is something that we call mathematical general relativity. I mean, if you think about Einstein, he wrote down his equations of general relativity that I will just call GR uh, in 1915. And what is very special about these equations, they unify everything. <laughs> so if you think about Newtonian mechanics, so you think of a space and time is absolute and you have your equations of motions in some Euclidean um, space. And what uh, Einstein did in 1905, he unified space and time into Minkowski space, or so a flat space time. And still you have Newtonian's laws of motion in that absolute space time. In 1915, what he did, and I'm going to write them down on the slide just in a moment. So Einstein unified everything else into this manifold. So if you think of two bodies moving under Newtonian gravitation, for instance, so what is different now is you don't have an absolute space behind, but these two bodies are part of the manifold that you're looking at. And they are structuring this manifold by themselves. And the equations in that sense are really the laws of the universe, if you want, written down as geometric equations. So I'll say more about that in a moment. So we'll talk about the answer equations and what does it mean to be a space-time manifold. And the Cauchy problem is just another name for initial value problem. So how do we specify initial data? We look out at maybe a galaxy or two black holes that will merge, etc., and send out gravitational waves. So how do we set that up mathematically as a problem for initial data and an evolution? And we'd like to know properties of this manifold and how do gravitational waves look like for different types of data? What can we read off from that? So what are gravitational waves? I mean, what are they? Any ideas? <laughs> well, if we, if we think of waves in all kinds of media, right? There's always a medium, something like uh, in water, you throw a stone into a pond, you see this wave pattern, so we understand what waves are in different um, circumstances. In the gravitational wave case, let me give you a philosophical first picture. I'll make that more precise as we go along in mathematical rigorous ways. But if you have, let's say, two black holes, a black hole we can think of is the end, sta end stadium, for instance, of a star, which is really big, bigger than our sun. So the stars have a lifetime. They they have fuel, which is hydrogen, that is uh, burned into helium. It goes up to higher elements, can be iron, etc. later on. But once you have f um, used up all the fuel, the star will actually, well, I'm going to abbreviate that quite a bit, but the end part will be a supernova where the outer shells are blown away. The inner part contracts. And for our sun, this will end up as a cold white dwarf. And if it's a little bit bigger than our sun, you will have an end stadium, which is a neutron star. And if it's yet bigger, so the end stadium will be a black hole. And the black hole, you can think of, so um, this matter is compressed so much that the gravitation is so strong that the curvature, gravitation, you can think of curvature of the manifold that we're going to look at, is so strong that whatever you try to send out from the <coughs> black hole is actually bending back. So that's the very, very pedestrian way of describing it. They'll have another definition later. But let's say we have, let's say, two black holes. And in Newtonian mechanics, if you have two objects like stars, etc., two for stars, two, 
they will just go around each other in this um, Keplerian orbits. However, if we have general relativity, the laws of TR tell us that these bodies will radiate away energy. So they lose energy, and what happens is that they move closer together and um, so rotate faster, and they will actually um, uh, merge in the end into one black hole. And here, waves gravitational radiation is sent out. You can think of that the two, two black holes have a certain mass. Um, one, a certain percentage of the mass, for instance, is radiated away in forms of gravitational waves. And the gravitational waves we think of is a fluctuation, a change of the curvature of our space-time manifold. I'm going to say more in a moment. So we would like to know when do singularities develop? Black holes is a very specific form of the singularity of the Einstein equations. They can also develop when radiation is concentrated. I'll say more about this later. And I'd like to explain what is now gravitational radiation. And in 2015, there was this breakthrough result. I mean, LIGO detected gravitational waves. They got the Nobel Prize um, two years, uh, just about one and a half years ago in physics for that. And what do we read off from gravitational waves? And what's, there's a lot of beautiful geometric analytic structures in the space times that are solution of the Einstein equations. I would like to know from the data something about the source. So the idea here is to develop an initial value problem for the Einstein equations, give an idea of what kind of problems there are along the way, and then um, make a relation be between gravitational radiation and how, how do we relate that to the source and what's the information we can actually get from that. Let me here cite just a letter from a letter that Einstein wrote to Sommerfeld. So this was just before Einstein completed his theory of general relativity. So uh, he said, at present, I occupy myself exclusively with the problem of gravitation and now believe that I shall master all difficulties with the help of a friendly mathematician. That was Marcel Grossman at ETH in Zurich. But one thing is certain. In all my life, I've never labored nearly as hard and have become imbued with great respect for mathematics, the subtle part of which I had in my simple-mindedness regarded as pure luxury until now. Compared with this problem, the original relativity is child's play. So it's just a little bit of a motivation to see Einstein had a lot of intuition already, but the, he, he thought that there is some geometry that needs to be, de be developed. And he went to Marcel Grossman, who was his friend, mathematician in Zurich. And Grossman said, well, the type of geometry that you're looking for was actually developed by Riemann a few decades before. And so from there on, I think Riemannian or pseudo-Riemannian geometry and and physics went hand in hand, actually. It was really a fruitful contact. And that's really beautiful in, in the sense you need the language you need to formulate these Einstein equations is basically Riemannian geometry. And from there, we do a lot of research. So here is another picture. So that's Einstein, of course. And that person you might know, that's um, Hurwitz from the Hurwitz polynomial and Hurwitz's daughter. So Einstein <laughs> liked to play the violin. <laughs> All right. So let me maybe also mention a few other people. There's, I mean, so many names that should be mentioned. I apologize, I cannot do that. But Hermann Weil and Yvonne Choquebria are two people who are really also fundamental in, in, this, um, in the whole procedure of setting up the initial value problem. I have not yet shown the Einstein equations. It will show up in a moment. But the question was, in 1915, so the Einstein equations, maybe I write them down anyway. So the Einstein equations were written down, right? So you have some geometry on the left hand side. I'll explain that in a moment. Curvature. And then you have some constant, I'm not going into detail, times a stress energy tensor. Mu, mu go from one to four. So basically, geometry is related to stress energy where other fields like electromagnetic fields, fluids show up and you have to also add the corresponding equations, let's say, if you plug in electromagnetic fields, you would have a coupled Einstein-Maxwell system that we would like to solve. Anyway, but let me maybe mention also Hermann Weyl. It's not clear, so I'll show you in a moment that this actually can be written as a nonlinear hyperbolic system of uh, PDEs, partial differential equations, which is not clear if you look at them just like that. And so her, the, the one thing is also Hermann Weyl brought up, um, at least philosophically, the idea of causality. So if you think of the simple wave equation in a flat background, so you have, of course, the speed of light and you have a domain of dependent theorem, right? You have causality. You can only influence something which lies within your light cone in the future. 
And something similar is true in, in, in uh, Einstein equations. So there's also a domain of dependence theorem. So Hermann Weyl was the first to not write it down in full details, but to, to come up with this notion. And then Yvonne Jocquebriat, she's now 95, lives in France. So she was the first person in 1952 to write down the well posters for these equations at all. So it took a long, long time to really write down the well posters for the Einstein equations. So let me, okay, here we're gonna talk about fluid. So maybe let me say something about this. So we have, that's a Hubble Space Telescope picture. And here there's one galaxy in the center and there's, you see this smeared out objects around, there's a one central galaxy and the smeared out objects here, this, that, here also, these are pictures, it's like it's a lensing effect, it's our pictures of, a, of another galaxy. So here is the middle galaxy, we are here, and then here is the galaxy that sends out light that we see at different times. So it's lens, the, the light is spent by the object in the middle, and we get this lensing effect. And this is actually one of the beautiful ways that with a Hubble Space Telescope, you can really see the curvature of the space time in the universe. So you can really see this lensing effect here that you can actually compute easily. All right, here are the Einstein equations. Again, so I'm not, you can solve them in, or formulate them in other dimensions. I'm in four space-time dimensions here. So what I'm looking for is our space-times, which are Lorentzian manifolds in four dimensions that solve the Einstein equations. So this is the Ricci curvature. And of course, if I'm in a manifold here, so my main interesting object will be the Riemannian curvature. So I'll have, Riemannian curvature that um, I can decompose into certain components. And so to say, one component of the Riemann curvature drives the gravitational wave field, the gravitational radiation, basically. But here on the left-hand side, so if I take the trace of the Riemann, I get the Ricci curvature, this is the metric, that's the scalar curvature. And as I said, here, I mean, the constant depends what kind of, as a mathematician, when you work in this field, you may just put this equals to one or something. So the constant varies on the right, right hand side. Anyway, so you have a geometric object which is linked to um, stress <coughs> energy of other fields. And as I said, we are looking for this equation, uh, this, this metric. Well, if you are interested in cosmology, then you don't find the cosmological constant there. That's Einstein came up with that later. So if you add this term, lambda is a cosmological constant times the metric on the left-hand side, you get the so-called cosmological Einstein equations. That's a whole other neat story. Einstein wanted to, he believed in a static universe and gravitation is of course contracting. So to counteract gravity, he invented this uh, plugged in this term into the original equations, and then you get the static, this static universe is one thing that you can get. But as we know, the universe is not static, and Eddington showed that his solution was unstable. And in 1927, Georges Lemaitre derived actually the expanding, a solution for an expanding universe that he matched with data of observation of Slipher. He had all this uh, redshift data in what they call nebulae in other galaxies, and he derived actually the so-called Hubble relation, but Hubble never really believed in an expanding universe. So that's a whole other story. But there's two different things. So this is a completely different equation than the other one. So the first equation without the <coughs> cosmological constant, if I look at physical systems that I would like to solve the problem for, like maybe two black holes or something, or I look at, I take some t equals zero, and I wanna look at maybe a galaxy that creates curvature locally, etc. And I can write down some geometric um, data and in weighted Sobolev spaces call them probably small. And then I'd like to know how does this data evolve under the Einstein equation. So that's what we would like to do. And if we think of, let's say, isolated systems, we can model them as asymptotically flat. This means like for two black holes, for instance, the next um, big object is far away. So I can look at this as asymptotically flat. They decay to Minkowski far away from where something is happening. And these space times have been investigated quite well. We have, we have, we know what the radiation field for many interesting space time, uh, space times looks like. And there is a well-defined um, mathematical formalism to write things down that I will show you in a moment. So, so let me, cosmological is the lambda, yes? Yeah. Yes, the lambda times, that's the, that's the cosmological constant. Yeah. And, and so it's just- If you play around with lambda, you're going to get different. 
Right, so addiction. exactly right. So here it's a positive one. So that would be if you believe. So in 1998, there were all this um, astrophysics. Uh, in astrophysics, was a big breakthrough, right? So they had measured uh, what we call standard candles, or what they measured is that actually the universe is expanding faster and faster, looking at certain sources that are moving away from us faster and faster. And so from that, so this stipulates to have a cosmological constant that makes the universe expand also. You can also get other things if you change, change lambda. But so if cosmological space times, you don't have a, such a nice way to actually write down radiation, you have to do something else. There's a problem there. You don't have a natural geometric uh, way to write down the radiation. Okay, and these are the Einstein vacuum equations. If on the right hand side, this happens to be really zero, then in two lines, you can show that if your space-time Ricci curvature is flat, again, Riemann curvature can blow up. So this is what we call Einstein vacuum equations, where only gravitation is active. And so the typical black holes um, are solutions of these equations, for instance. So we have a black hole with rotation, what we call the Kerr solution. So this will be a solution of the Einstein vacuum. Okay, let me explain a little bit about how do we actually set up an initial value problem first. When you look at this equation, it's absolutely not clear what you should do with it. And so many people worked on that, but so basically what I have to say, the Einstein equations also decouple into a set of evolution equations and constraint equations. So if I think of initial data at some time t0, I will have a three-dimensional Riemannian manifold as initial data with induced metric and what's going to be the second fundamental form that I would like to involve when I choose a time function. So I would like to involve the data. So I would like to embed that into my four dimensional manifold that I'm constructing. Moreover, in the Einstein equations, I don't have a background manifold. So I have to construct the manifold while I'm actually um, solving this problem. So the constraints are constraints on the initial data. I cannot just choose any initial data. They have to fulfill this constraint equation, which is one portion of the Einstein equations. And the other set is a hyperbolic evolution problem. Well, if you look at it first, it looks parabolic, but you can actually write it down as a hyperbolic system of equations. And so people like, so Darmois noticed already that there are actually constraints in general relativity. And he looked at analytic space like, um, uh, at the analytic space like slices, if you choose a time function, but if you use analytic functions, that's too much to ask for. You can, the analytic functions do not, um, detect propagation of waves. So that's too, too, too strong. Nevertheless, so I mean, I can think of, let's say, a metric of this type. So I have some function here, which is called the lapse function times t t squared plus this I can choose to be zero, for instance. n is a shift vector and a spatial metric that I drag, that I actually have here. And so Lichnerowitz also showed that in the analytic case as well, that, well, for a zero shift and arbitrary lapse, you can have this uh, decomposition of your metric and, um, yeah. However, that's the first step. It's not clear from the Einstein equation that you can have anything like that, but it turns out that it's rather arbitrary to choose a time function also. So what is initial data really for the Einstein equation? What we have really is we have a three-dimensional manifold, I call it H, so that I can think of this as a space-like slice of my um, space-time with a complete metric G bar and the symmetric two tensor. So once I, this is gonna be the second fundamental form with respect to a time vector field actually. And some initial conditions which correspond to matter fields if I have something on the right hand side here. Now, but also, of course, they have to now fulfill one part of Einstein's equations, which are called the constraints. And a Cauchy development then is nothing else. So I have a globally hyperbolic space time I would like to get that solves the Einstein equations and then embedding from my space like hypersurface into the full manifold, where, I mean, the initial data embeds as the first and second fundamental forms in the manifold. Okay, but what are the constraints? Let me just write them down. So the barred quantities are in space-like surfaces. So barred means in a space-like part. So if I have on the right-hand side some energy momentum tensor, uh, I'll get a contribution from that. If I have a lambda, if it's lambda is zero, it's not there, of course, but if I have a lambda that shows up, and then I have k and trace of k, so which you can think of as second fundamental forms. 
So these are the two type, two, um, two equations that are called the constraint equations. Just as a little, um, uh, little e example, right? If you have, let's say, one extended body for a, a black hole solution, if I add another one, the sum is not a solution of the constraint equations. Uh, it's a nonlinear problem. You don't expect that to be anyway. But certain things you could do is maybe far away, maybe if you have two bodies, you plug them together. So you can say that still far away, um, approximately the constraint equations are solved. So you can um, manage that. But this is in general not a solution. So, so this one says how uh, they mathematically impose, or are uh, they just trying to interpret it? And, and, and one tries to interpret this uh, uh, phys physically, or are they actually naturally? Done? They are naturally. So if you write down the Einstein equations and you just look at how um, in in um, with the, so one thing is the Gauss equation contracted up here, guys. Basically, if you look at how do I embed a hypersurface into a, into another manifold, so that's so one is just the geometric equations, but if I now apply to this embedding the Einstein equations, they come out naturally. So they are really part of the Einstein equations, not imposed extra. It's, it's the Einstein equations couple into, decouple into constraints and evolution part. And actually they propagate. So, I mean, what's true for the initial data has to be true. So the constraints propagate. And again, Dagmo showed it in the analytic case in Chocolate uh, proof that, that in general, yes, they hold actually for each space-like slice. Is there some physical interpretation of the constraints? Right, um, okay. so. The physical interpretation is well if you look at that right so there's some so there's a relation between the second fundamental form and the that's that's the scalar curvature of your space like slice the full one is zero so the asymptotic equation right so basically it's um it tells you a relation um within each each slice of let's say if you want to plug in bodies or, or whatever so it tells you a relation for instance how um, if, if you plug in here an electromagnetic field or something, how this interacts with the rest of the geometry. And if nothing is in there, so there's still vacuum equations, does not mean vacuum, there's energy in it. And you can even define uh, something like mass, etc., cetera, for uh, Einstein vacuum space times. So <clears throat> it gives you a relation between how, I mean, cur how uh, gravitation interacts maybe within each, each slide. So it's a geometric equation, but because it's coming from the Einstein equation that you impose, or that you not impose, but the Einstein equations for these geometric slices gives you then this natural condition. Okay. Now then the data evolves according to, so if you have initial data G bar and K, so they evolve under these laws. So here we have phi is again a lapse function to tell you how we come from one slice to another. X is a shift vector and all the bar quantities are in a space like slice. So a time vector field here would be T which is phi n plus X. And so if you look at that, so this does not look hyperbolic, it's a propagation equation. However, you can actually transform this really into a hyperbolic system of equations. So you have to do a little bit more work here. And that's what actually Elon Schoenke will have it. Also, I have to say, I didn't mention that before, but so here is something, a, a nice feature, a mathematical feature, which has a physical meaning also. So if I look at the metric, uh, this is the unknown. So if I take symmetry into account, I have 10 unknowns of the metric that I need to find. But I only have six independent equations. So it means I have four degrees of freedom to make choices. So I have uniqueness of solutions only up to diffeomorphism. And this is exactly what you want if you want to uh, do coordinate transformations. That's exactly what you need. And it, it's also basically saying that the laws of physics in one part of the universe are the same like in another. That's exactly how it should be. Okay, now we've evolved the initial data. So there's many questions you can ask. Yeah? So when, when you're... You may have clarified this, but when you're setting your initial data to be a three manifold H, mm -hmm. uh, and if you want to reconstruct your M, aren't you going to get something like like your H warped around some interval? So you're not assuming that there is like everybody creates the same clock in a way. So that that's work? so there's various things. First of all, I can choose a time function, uh -huh. and so here this is quite arbitrary, and I'm interested in let's say physical space times where so. 
I look at space times which are globally hyperbolic. This means they admit a Cauchy hypersurface, meaning that if I have, um, let's say, a geodesic, right, or, or a, a curve that is either time-like or no, it intersects this Cauchy hypersurface exactly once, not twice, not never. So I kind of exclude certain periodic solutions, for instance, and this kind of thing. You can, of course, create this kind of solutions, but in, if you try to evolve, let's say, for a galaxy, etc., so you can exclude this type of solutions because, I mean, it hasn't shown up in astrophysics. But mathematically, you can get all kinds of, of other space times. Here, I'm talking only about globally hyperbolic space times. Other questions? Yeah. But on the previous slide, yeah. uh, you had the derivative of the, the metric. Uh, this x, is that an arbitrary vector field? Or, or uh, x is a shift vector. So it just tells me basically, oh, and that's okay. also something, if I, on one slice, t equals, what is equals zero, I go with the time function. So I have a, a, a propagation with the time function. So I go to the next slice. It just tells me, not the lapse tells me how far I go, but it's the shift vector. I can actually shift. From the normal direction. Oh, is that the NIs that you had on the uh, Oh, yeah. The yeah, I guess I changed my notation with four. No, so, yeah, these right. So, the NIs will give you the shift vector here. That's the same thing. So, that's the same thing as right. the X. Right. So, I, yeah. so, here it's just the vector X. But again, so if you, you have free, a freedom, four degrees of freedom to choose something, so often you choose, for instance, the X to be just zero. Uh, there was another question. I was actually going to ask the same. Thing. Ah, okay. Yeah, that's the shift vector. You can put it to zero if you like for, for the rest of the talk. So now, what happens now on short and long term uh, with this initial data? So their singularity is actually quite a, singularity and energy are two kind of obscure, so kind of obscure entities in general relativity. If you think about it, how would you define energy? So we know this, um, like Einstein, and you can read in many textbooks. So I can actually transform away the gravitational field, which would be the metric on, at any point, right? So it, with other words, I cannot distinguish also, I cannot distinguish between if I'm locked up in an elevator in free fall or if I'm out in space in free fall, if I don't know where I am. So and I can actually locally transform away the gravitational field. How do I define energy with something like that? The problem. So the next thing is, well, maybe we cannot define energy at the point, but let's try to integrate probably over a sphere and integrate something is still a question what, but integrate something over a sphere to get something like a quasi-local mass or energy. And there's all kinds of different um, uh, notions, for instance, for a space-like slice, for asymptotically flat space times, I can write down mass, linear angular momentum in terms of geometric, in a geometric uh, way. And therefore, energy is still a big wide open problem. We understand energy, we can write down energy. I need to understand that to say something about radiation, but we, can, we understand that for large classes of space times, for instance, a lot of asymptotically flat space times, or many of them, and different notions of energy come into the game. But we have to make sure what is the right notion of energy in general relativity. Because if I'm just in a completely open, without constraint space time, then this, this is still open as nobody has an idea. But for many situations where physics tells us what to look at, we do have some notion. Okay, but there are some problems. And let me just maybe <laughs> ask a few questions if you want to solve these equations. So of course, what about well postness, local and global? So existence and uniqueness of solutions, of course, but also, I mean, when which solution, which space times have gravitational waves? How do they look like? How do we characterize them, etc.? But again, we have some problems. First of all, the general covariance of Einstein equations that I just mentioned before, and also we don't have a differentiable structure yet. I mean, we are constructing the manifold as we are solving the equations. How do we deal with that problem? Not so clear at the beginning. So anyway, but um, again, I use global hyperbolicity. That's exactly the, uh, who asked that now? You did. So uh, that's exactly the question. So I have global hyperbolicity. So I have a Cauchy hypersurface. So any time like or null geodesic or curve intersects this exactly once. I don't have periodic uh, solutions to something. 
Okay, so I look at initial data of a certain type. Let's look at maybe asymptotically flat also, but we can have others. And then I want to solve the problem locally and globally. And not only that, I want to know if black holes form. What are singularities? How do they look like? Black holes are a very weird type of singularity. There are others as well. So what about stability of, of galaxies, etc.? So I already mentioned asymptotically flat a few times. So this means just like you have a galaxy or two black holes, there's curvature generated generally, but far away things decay to Minkowski. So I'll use that quite a bit. So here is the well posted result of Shoke Kuya. So this is Shoke Kuya 1952, and then with Bob Garrosh in 1969, we had another thing. So this is now written down just for the Axon Vanshan equations, but it's been generalized for most matter or energy fields that uh, show up in nature. So if you have initial data of the type that I just mentioned to you, that satisfies the vacuum constraint equations, then there exists a space time which satisfies the Einstein vacuum equations and H embeds into M as a space-like surface with, as we said, the induced metric and second fundamental form. So that's a local well postness result. And because then, I mean, the next result here is also interesting. And again, from 1915 to 52 is quite a time gap. It was not obvious how to actually come up with this idea. And then together with Chirac, she showed also that, well, we know more if you have, again, the same type of initial data, they should there exist a unique globally hyperbolic maximal space time, again, which solves the Einstein equations and where things embed at, as a Cauchy surface, a maximal in the sense I can think of, I take some initial data, I construct a space time for time, well, for all time, I construct some extension of this as a space time, so the maximal extension is the space time in which this embeds to. There's one space time in which every extension of the initial data embeds into. So that's a um, very important result. But of course, you don't know yet, how about singularity, stability? So this has to be addressed, right? That's not given by this. But maybe because it's really- the question on the previous uh, slide, if you had K, yeah, uh, goes to the, the zero, which means that the evolution of the uh, metric, the three of the geometry goes to zero um, as you go uh, this is, fast enough? Is that, um, this is spatially. It, so it's basically that picture. So I have, this is spatially. So I and J are spatial coordinates. So if I, if I let T constant for the moment, right? So I have the metric, which goes to just uh, Minkowski metric, or this will be, uh, well, it's not Minkowski, it's three-dimensional, it's Riemannian metric, the Euclidean delta ij. So I'm cutting out time right now, so I'm just on a... So when you say fast enough, does this mean fast enough as you go forward in time, or does it fast enough... Spatially. Up and spatially. Right. And so this k there is the same then as at the subsequent... Uh, as the in the next slide, slide. yes, the next slide, yeah, these two k's are right. the same, right? So, you yeah. should think of this spatially. So, this let's just fix a time and I look at could be initial data or a uh, later time. So, if I look locally, so my metric and second yeah. momentum function do all kind of weird things, but when I go very far out, right? So, oh, things will it's, decay. It's, yeah, it's yeah. really the picture that it decays to Minkowski when you're far away from the, the source, constant. yeah. Oh, and by the way, uh, you were saying something about the problem uh, about uh, the definition of uh, energy. If you have the stress energy tensor there, yeah. uh, the components, uh, the, for example, the zero zero component mm -hmm. would have a well uh, uh, defined uh, definition of what energy oh, is yeah, that locally. Local. But, I th but I th is it correct to say that when you were saying energy is not well defined, you're uh, referring to a local definition of gravitational energy? It's the gravitational energy. And it you can think, right. Which is different from the team you knew. Oh, very different. So the team you knew, I have a slide addressing that in a moment, but so the funny thing is, yes, there is an energy for that. If you couple it, decouple it from Einstein, forget about Einstein equation, then this is all well defined for the, on the right hand side if you plug in regular matter or energies. On the other hand, when you couple it to Einstein equations, you couple it to the gravitational energy and the gravitational energy per se is not understood. And whatever the energy is either in Einstein vacuum has to be defined and if there is something on the right hand side, then it has to be defined as a whole system. So the gravitational part is the problem. Locally, but not globally, because you say uh, uh, that uh, 
asymptotically that you, you can define uh, that gravitational energy? So for asymptotically flat systems, like, I mean, I'm pointing at that picture, but you can specify the decay rates actually here. So, and you can make it more rigorous. So this is formulated in weighted solvolev spaces that have to be, uh, weighted solvolev norms of your data that have to be small enough. So you have certain decay that you get. And um, basically there's something called the ABM energy linear momentum and momentum for, if, if this data, it decays fast enough, then all of this, there, there can be written down mass, linear and angular momentum at, which is basically an integral over a sphere at spatial infinity. So for each spatial uh, space like slice, you have a notion like that. However, if you generalize this and this decays very, very slowly, then angular momentum, for instance, is not known. So it, you, you lose something if you go more general. Interesting. Okay, so let's look at the, uh, maybe very briefly at the, Sorry. yeah. Uh, one more question. Uh, so at the previous slide, um, the, the two theorems that uh, are talking about embedding H into M, mm -hmm. is that pretty much saying that uh, previous space times are outside of the light cone for a future space time? Mm, there is a domain of dependence that actually is important that we need to use here, but what it says is really, so let's say you can produce, so your, sp your maximal space time is the one like, an M, like in, uh, in which everything else is contained. Okay, so here is just an idea of the proof by Jacques Gebrouillard. So she used wave coordinates. Again, the main laws do not depend on coordinates. So you want to have invariant formulations, but certain coordinates help you see things more easily <coughs> and others just, well, block the main uh, quantities from you. So she used wave coordinates um, to, trap, to write down the equations in wave coordinates. So here, this is just box with respect to G phi is given, it's, it's just a well-known box operator with respect to that metric. So I have the wave equation, so my coordinates have to satisfy a wave equation. So she writes down the Einstein equations in these wave coordinates. So if you don't have, you can also call them harmonic if you are in the, but with the sign Lorentz being Lorentz, we call them wave coordinates. So, and this can be written down equivalently as um, these coordinates satisfy this equation. This is just the Christoffel symbols here showing up. And if I now take the Einstein vacuum equations and write them in these coordinates, so Shoke wrote that, so I have the box operator, the wave operator on my metric. And on the right hand side, I have a term which is nonlinear. In fact, it's actually quasi linear. So I'm not writing it out, but it's a quasi linear term in terms of the metric and its first derivative. So it's a very, very nice hyperbolic system. So, and, so by doing that, she gets really a wave equation basically out of it. And so it's a quasi-linear wave equation. And again, so she was able to formulate and apply a, a domain of dependence theorem also for this fully nonlinear problem. And with that, she was able to prove this well posted result. So you really, this is the first time really rigorously that the initial value problem was not only written down, but you have really a local result, uh, which is rigorous. Okay, energy. So energy is a problem, that's the, that's what I said. Let me tell you something about energy that we know. First of all, let me, I'm going to go in the wrong direction. I mean, it's all correct on the slide, but let me lead you in the wrong direction first. So if you look at the Bianchi identity, just from differential geometry, this is a Riemannian curvature. I have the Bianchi identity and I can actually contract this twice. And then I get, so G is just the left hand side of my uh, Einstein equations. But if I contract the Bianchi identity twice, I get the nabla j, gij, which is the left hand side, the gij of the Einstein equations to be zero. And this implies, of course, just by the Einstein equations that actually the versions of the stress energy is zero. But the stress energy tensor, despite this name, it's actually not a tensor, it's only a pseudo tensor. It has nothing to do with energy in GR. It's perfect when you take away Einstein equations, then there's a well-defined energy and it makes perfect sense. But if you couple it to general relativity, it, it's not the energy that you can use. It's not, it's not, does not make sense anymore. So there's a problem. However, let's go back to, let's go to Noether. Emmy Noether, you know, and appreciate all her theorems. We know that if you have, let's say in a Lagrangian setting, right? So if you have some <clears throat> continuous group of transformations which leaves, which leaves the Lagrangian invariant, so this would usually correspond to some quantity that is conserved, very generally speaking. So that's great. So let's 
make use of that. However, again, GR in the most general setting, there's no symmetries. How do you use that? So, but again, nature is nice. And let's go back. That's why I uh, introduced asymptotically flat. So asymptotically flat, let's say a galaxy here, etc., translated into curvature. So it means that in the background, because things go to Minkowski space, I don't have really symmetries, but I have something like quasi-symmetries. I can use some of the huge symmetry, uh, symmetry group of, of Minkowski space in my uh, manifold. And I can think of this as making maybe corrections to, I make some error using this as a, as a real symmetry, but there's something that I can use asymptotically as a symmetry. So, so you say in space times where, which have symmetries, the problem with energy does not exist? Well, it depends. I mean, there are many cosmological spaces, for instance, that are very simple. Then there is a well-defined energy, et cetera. But that's very straightforward. So we have a lot of symmetry. And in certain uh, situations, you can define energy nicely. But still, in cosmological space times that are realistic, there's still a big problem. Like FLW? FL, FLRW is very homogeneous. So that's a nice background space time to have. But if you look at the uh, the data that we have from astrophysics, there's a lot of inhomogeneity actually in the background structure. And um, so it's not FLRW anymore. So this is deviated from that. So we have something called Lambda CDM, which is very inhomogeneous. And uh, it would be nice to talk about this. Maybe at the end, I can state the result. We can also address that problem there. But again, energy is not, well, in FLRW, we can write it down, but not in the general case. I have a question about the last slide. Slide. Bottom there. Uh, this one. The Here. Uh, something. Oh, yeah. Symmetries there next to the last line. Uh, aren't uh, these equations symmetric, that is, uh, invariant under arbitrary coordinate transformations? So you can go from one to any uh, other coordinate transformations, and the structure is still uh, the same. Yeah, you have a diffeomorphism invariant in that exactly. sense. That's yeah. right. And, but it doesn't help to, to define an energy in general. So it's not, for instance, if I have asymptotic, I'll just tell you a little bit more. If I have asymptotically flat, I can get a notion, right? That, as we just said before, in a space like slice, what's the energy of a space or the mass or whatever of a space like slice and see how this propagates, for instance. But if I don't have the K conditions here, I don't know if this, that's open. But you're right, there is some, there are some symmetries, but they don't necessarily help you to actually uh, extract energies in general. So if you take, for example, an infinitesimal coordinate transformation, mm -hmm. then the equation, so and the, these uh, would be uh, the, the generators of the transformation, uh -huh. of the arbitrary transformation, and they would give you uh, then this law that you put up uh, there, mm -hmm. namely that the divergence of the G tensor is zero and mm -hmm. that hence also the T tensor is zero. Right. But the, the problem is, my point is, this is not an energy. So first of all, the T <coughs> is a pseudo tensor, and this equation is not energy conservation. Are these TIJs, are, are they the ING? Are these spatial components? Oh, no, oh, sorry. I Actually, now I'm in space, space time, so I oh. should have written out that we've done. Oh, sorry. <coughs> okay. This is in space time. So, what I just heard you say is that this tensor T IJ is not a tensor. No, only it transforms tensor. like a pseudo tensor. It does not transform like a tensor. Yeah, yeah so that's a, that's a problem. Uh, I can show you details if you like, but it does not transform like a tensor. So here is something we can do. So if you are just Einstein vacuum equations, so there's, there's certain things we can do. And here, so there's something called the Bell-Robinson tensor, and this can actually fill in for many for energies to do estimates in the, in the sense we, we do PDEs. So you want to solve PDEs and, and control the solution. So this is the just the definition of the Bell-Robinson, and we can think of it as W means wild curvature. So if I'm in a space um, in a in a space time, just a solution of the Einstein vacuum equations, the Riemannian curvature is actually just the wild curvature. It's the traceless part of the Riemann curvature. It's just the wild. There's no because the rich and the parts are zero. So this is basically quadratic of my wild tensor, and it has all the nice properties. It's positive if we plug in future directed time-like vectors, <coughs> which has a divergence property, so this is zero. And so this is just the Hodge duals that I plug in here. So basically it's a quadratic of the wild tensor. 
and it has very nice properties. I cannot use the team you knew. This is not an energy uh, in principle in GR. So, but this is actually a very nice tensor. Yeah. How hard is it to show that there's only a vital component of the curvature tensor? That there is what? That only that the only non-curvature component is the vital component. So if you write out the Riemann curvature tensor, you have the wild part and then the part with the Ricci and, and scalar curvature involved. Yeah. And if I'm actually in Einstein vacuum, right? If I'm just looking at Mach unique equations. So these are the Einstein vacuum equations, and then also the Ricci is zero. So it just means that everything else there is zero. If I'm looking at the solution of the Einstein vacuum equation, so the Riemann is just a wild tensor. Of course, it's not true if you have something on the right hand side. <laughs> okay. Now, if I contract my Q with some future directed vector fields, I mean, then I can obtain a current. So I can write down a current. I can play around with a nice divergent theorem. And actually, so if I look at the bounded domain in my space time, et cetera, and I can also make sense of curvature flux, et cetera. So I'm gonna use that in a moment. So if I look at some bounded domain and, and its boundary, and then a portion of this bounded domain is what we call a null hypersurface. So Speed of light is the upper bound in general relativity, and electromagnetic waves, massless particles, uh, gravitational waves go at the speed of light. They travel along, we call them light cones, but it has a lot of not structure, these hypersurfaces. It gives us also foliation, basically, of the space time. So part of this will be a null hypersurface, C, and the generating vector field here I call L. I have a picture in a moment. So I can write down the curvature flux actually through that part of the boundary. So I take my current, right? I contract here with L, the generating vector field of this outgoing light cone, and I can write down the curvature flux across these null boundaries. You say if, uh, why would it not? So what? And you say if this boundary contains the portion. Um, oh, it does. Okay. I didn't, did I say if? No, no, I mean just in the, slide you're saying if so i'm saying is why how, how could you pick such a ah uh, no i mean you can always pick something that looks very weird and has maybe some i mean make it space-like and time-like but not now i mean that's yeah okay so here is maybe one um, stability proof i'd like to mention and um, so that was by chris and kleinemann in the 90s so if you have now initial data which is small in weighted sobel f norms and decaying to Minkowski in uh, far away, then they showed that you have the global solution of the Einstein vacuum equations that do not have singularities, no black holes, but they're still globally hyperbolic and decaying to uh, Minkowski at the expected rate. So for that, you needed to have smallness assumptions on the data in weighted solar spaces, but I'm still interested in, in other things like large data. So let me say why this is interesting. So we could generalize this also in terms of decay rates, et cetera. So I generalized that, for instance, in, in the sense that you have now the borderline decay of the data. So uh, if your data is just by an epsilon generalized or, or we, um, decaying less than that, so you can show that things, certain energy um, energies are not controlled anymore and things cannot be controlled. But here, why is this interesting? Because, I mean, if I think now of, large data, like black holes sitting in there. So we have some recent results by Vaji and Hintz in a cosmological setting with, a black, with black holes. You can ask, if I perturb a black hole space-time, does it again go back into another black hole space-time? So it's a stability issue. In the fully nonlinear case for asymptotically flat, that's still an open problem. And in a cosmological case, we have better decay of the data, basically. It's just been, it, it was shown uh, recently by Vashi and, and Hintz that we have stability in that sense. But let's see, I, I'd like to see more than that. I'd like to see maybe several black holes, two black holes merging, and they create gravitational waves, etc. This is large data. However, from this result, still one got a very good description of null infinity. If something is happening down here, so, if I'm very far away, let's say go along a light cone or a null hypersurface far away from the source, then up here is where we do an experiment where gravitational waves would actually come and pass us. So we know black holes exist, and even though in the most let's say, mathematical way, we cannot yet even solve, let's say, extended bodies coming in, merging, etc. However, we can solve for classes of space times where these are included um, certain problems. You can say, well, 
I can plug in now large data, and from this result I just cited and others, we know how the null geometry far away from the source looks like. So you can plug in large data, and because the the way this geometric um, uh, the geometry basically survives very far away from the source is largely independent from the smallness of the data. So we know for large classes of space times a lot about how the gravitational radiation should look like far away from the source. So what I say is you know the initial value problem for classes of space times, and even sometimes you can plug in large data, but there's a problem, right? If you have too large data, black holes might form. This is not what you, this is also interesting, but I'm, I'm going the other way around. I'd like to see um, what's happening out here. So this is just, I have a foliation into a uh, space-like hypersurfaces, but also what is important, the null hypersurfaces, so the foliations in this light cone of these null hypersurfaces. And here maybe some little bit of technical detail. So L is the generating vector field, oops, sorry in the outgoing direction here, an L bar will be an incoming vector field that generates an incoming null hypersurface. And so the metric of this, if I plug it into my space time metric, so this gives me a minus two, that's just a convention, but these are null vector fields. Now these null vector fields, I'm interested to relate something that happens locally to global results, to global structure. So what I can do is here, again, I have black holes that merge, something happens, locally here and let's say I'm sitting like here maybe this is now if I intersect the null hypersurface with a space like one I get a two-dimensional Riemannian surface um, manifold here with some nice structure and often I can solve the equations on that and use propagation equations along the other hypersurfaces to get global results so I introduce a null frame so where I have let's say L is in the outer direction L bar in the inward direction, I call this E4 and E3, and then I have frame, an orthonormal frame, which is just on this surface, which is a two-dimensional space like the one in So I introduce a null frame here, just ortho orthonormal on S, and then L and L bar. Now, what is future null infinity? So this is the this is where we are. So if you have something happening here, gravitational waves are coming out when T goes to infinity. And then we are sitting up here. This is future null infinity, I call it I plus. And that's where gravitational waves were detected. That's where we are. The waves are traveling along this null hypersurfaces. And basically what we do, we look backwards in time along the geometry of the surface, if you want. So it gives us some idea about the geometry of, of the surface and hopefully about the source when we detect gravitational waves. I'm going to say more about that. All right. So that's future null infinity. And basically, with I can shoot out geodesics and they will interact this null infinity at the sphere, at the round sphere. What is the black hole reach? And I gave you the pedestrian definition of a black hole. Here is a geometric definition. So if um, null infinity is just the same definition, it's defined like that. If I have a black hole reach and I don't see everything of the space time from the black hole reach, and this is like cut off, right? So the black hole region of an asymptote without that space time is then the set of points, so maybe I have to say, what is J negative of P, if I have a point here, P, then the backward light cone and its interior is everything that influences my point P, right? I really like in the wave equations. And so this is a set of points of my manifold, which is not in the past or future null infinity. With other words, right, I'm here at future null infinity. And basically, if I have a black hole somewhere here, it will be cut off, right? So the black hole region is defined as not being in the past or future null infinity, meaning I cannot see it. Nothing escapes to from it. So that's a geometric definition. There's others, but let me stay with that. So in order to maybe the last few minutes boil things down to the core part, so how, what relates to gravitational radiation? There's a lot of beautiful geometric structures. I'm just skipping now, but geometric structures coupled to analysis. What can we extract? So let me say, so we have this structure here. So I'm sitting on the surface S. I can write down the second fundamental form with respect to the outgoing null vector field. I call this chi. The incoming is chi bar. And if, if I take the shear, the traceless part of this, these are the shears. So these are the shears. And then I have the traces of these, which give me expansion scalars. And these, guys, these um, objects have limits at null infinity, 
for certain classes of space times, not for everything, but for certain classes of asymptotically flat space times, we have well-defined limits of these objects. And they, in, so here is something, for instance, so the trace chi bar is supposed to be negative anyway, but the trace of chi, right, that's the outgoing light cone. So that's supposed to actually go out, but this, if this is negative, it means that outgoing light cone is bending back. And we call this actually a trapped surface. Well, the trapped surface is, um, so how, is related to black holes. So here's an interesting result by Penrose. He showed that if you have um, a space time, is future null basically incomplete. They call it a singularity theorem, but it's actually an incomplete theorem. If, well, Ricci has to be positive for null vectors, and there exists a non-compact Cauchy hypersurface, um, and there is a closed trapped surface. So if the following actually holds, you have an incomplete space on your space and cannot be complete. Meaning if you have a closed trapped surface, your space time is incomplete. That's the, 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 the main essence. And so a really very simplified but nice version of Chris Google's latest result of 2018 means take the isomachium equations, and now, in the isomachium equations, if there is enough energy coming in, as you can think of, gravitational waves are concentrated in a small space-time region. So if enough energy in form of gravitational waves concentrates, then a closed trapped surface and eventually a black hole will form. So these closed trapped surfaces are one way to capture black, black holes or black hole formation. Okay, waves. We know these are fluctuations of space-time. So this is the source, like black holes, binary stars merging. They travel at long time-like um, uh, curves, and they send out gravitational waves. And this is um, where we are sitting out here. This is our um, null infinity. Now, here, by the way, there's just one way to this define. We talked about energy. And again, there's many ways to define that. So Hawking came up with one <laughs> mass, which locally here I integrate Forget about that, the details here, but I integrate over something which is diffeomorphic to its sphere locally. And you see this are the trace chi and trace chi bar, the expansion scalars. So if you integrate that, uh, then this object gives you a quasi-local mass, which is called the Hawking mass. There are other quasi-local masses now that Yao and Wang, for instance, came up with, which are very um, interesting and have a lot of nice properties. So this thing, for many space times, has a limit at null infinity. And this is what we call the Bondi mass. Well, what is the Bondi mass? The Bondi mass measures, and this is why I bring it up in radiation, the Bondi mass is a mass up at null infinity where we are doing observations that measures how much radiation has escaped or how much mass is still in the system, right? So the Bondi mass is, is a measure for that. Now, there is a Bondi mass loss formula. U is my foliation of the space time to this null hypersurface. So it's a parameter basically at null infinity also. It's a function at null infinity. So that's, that xi is the shear, it's what the, sh the incoming shear at null infinity. And so this, it's what the physicists call the news tensor. You integrate that over the sphere at null infinity and this gives you the Bondi mass loss formula saying so much mass has been radiated away in the system. So this is, of course, related to many structures. So I take a few more minutes, I guess, if that's maybe four. Yeah, you had a lot of questions. Okay, yeah, right. Okay, okay. yeah, yeah, I missed some. So, okay, so the Earth, for instance, changes also the curvature around itself. It has to be taken into account in GPS, otherwise GPS will not work, for instance. So these are pulsars. This is two different experiments, but the same idea. If these are pulsars, so, <clears throat> Pulsars are really good, very precise clocks. So this um, also send out gravitational waves, etc. But if you think of any points in the space time um, which are close by and then gravitational waves come through, then of course the gravitational wave is a change in the curvature. It means that the distance of these masses will change. And on the right hand side, this is really the setup of the LIGO experiment. LIGO in 2015 has actually found for the first time gravitational waves. And that's really the beginning of a new era where you can really see deeper into space where electromagnetic waves cannot come from, but it's like, like taking the pulse of the universe. So if you go out to space, that would all be easy. We would all float on geodesics, but here on Earth, you have to subtract things from the Earth. There's noise you have to subtract. And also, if you look at um, the, 
you have test masses. So here, here, and here, you have three test masses, like these are mirrors, which are suspended by pendulums, and very far away from the source, so the wave looks like a, a, a plane wave. It's not really a plane wave, it's something else. At the beginning, it decays and decays further, but basically, if you think that from the orthogonal direction the wave is coming, then your motion will be uh, confined to that plane. So here is just the, the same picture, but you have the three test masses that are sitting there and doing nothing. They are floating on their geodesics, if you want, in the direction where there's free motion. And now if a wave train comes, right, there's a wave train coming through from a binary black hole merger. So the curvature changes, so the distance changes. So by laser interferometry, they measure very accurately the distance between these test masses. And what they have seen so far is really the change of these geodesics, respectively test masses, while the wave train is coming through. And something to say here, the curvature is really the thing to look at. Metric, you can transform away, you can play around with that and write it down in certain coordinates that makes sense too. But the curvature is your actual object that you would like to sit on to work with. So the Riemann curvature cannot be transformed away. That's, that's the reality right, of the manifold. And now let's go back, let's go and talk a little bit about differential geometry. What kind of simple equations govern that? And then the other part, the geometric analytic picture of solving these Einstein equations has a lot of, a lot of structure that in the end boils down to something very simple to see in an experiment. So by the way, that's the Livingston, that's in, so they are LIGO has two um, parts, Livingston and Louisiana and one in Washington state. And so one arm, so we have three test masses. So one arm is something like four miles long. And so this is really where they have, have been doing this experiment. So there's Virgo also now in Italy. And yeah, so they, Rainer Weiss, uh, Ray Weiss, very, very, she kicked through and got the Nobel Prize for this, for the first detection. And the first detection was really in September, 2015. And well, I think it's really the beginning of something new because looking at that and knowing something about the Einstein equations will tell us more about the sources and the space time between the source and us. So I think it's the beginning of something new also for beautiful problems in math. So back to that, I have not said everything. So what they have seen yet uh, is number one, instantaneous displacements, right? So the wave comes through and then these things change. But from the, it's predicted by the Einstein equation that there is more, there's something called a memory effect. Has not yet been seen, but LIGO hopefully will see it in the near future. So this is a permanent change of the space time by the radiation itself. So once the wave package has traveled through, you'll have a permanent change of the space time. And this will be a permanent change in the places where these masses are. So what is that? Let me say something. So there are three people to be mentioned. First, Seldovich and Polyarev. They looked at the linearized Einstein equations in the 70s, and they found such a memory, which is very tiny. Chrysodoula in 91 looked at the fully nonlinear equations and found also a memory, which is much bigger. And that one should be able, uh, we should be able to observe. However, people always thought, these are other people who, Damour, Blanchet, et cetera, I didn't find pictures of Rizke, which who, but there's other people who worked on the pioneer, I mean, in the pioneering days on this memory. But for quite a long time, people believe that this is one thing that has just a linear and a nonlinear no, uh, way to, to, to show itself. However, with Garfinkel, we showed that um, these are two types of, there are two types of memory. What people call linear is an ordinary effect that is related to some other source than the one that in the nonlinear case shows up. So it has nothing to do with nonlinearity. There are two types of memory which show us displacement, but which are source different. And with um, uh, Yao and Chen, we showed that electromagnetic fields on the right hand side of the Einstein equations also enlarge this memory effect. And with Garfinkel, we showed that neutrinos do, etc. So there's been a lot of work lately on these things. Um, well, maybe I just say, we thought in GR, in general relativity, it's very weird that you have a memory effect, but nothing else in other theories. So Garfinkel and I thought, well, let's check just Maxwell equations. They are linear without GR, just Maxwell equations. And we found two analogs of these two types of memory for the pure Maxwell equations. So we hope that this will be seen in a lab at some point. But so there are analogs, actually. This is not just GR. It's just something a bit weird to think of. And now, so people like Strominger and many of his students looked at many analogs in string theory and other types of, of physics. So there's, there seem to be many analogs in other places. 
Okay, maybe oh, I summarize in two minutes, if that's okay. So this is curvature. Alpha bar is just the leading order part of the wild curvature. If there is stuff on the right hand side, then there's V1 curvature that has Ricci and other parts. But if nothing else is there, it's just the wild curvature going like one over R. So there's a lot of structure. I decompose according to my null frame in outgoing directions and the orthonormal frame of the sphere. And then let's just see there's some part that goes like one over R. And if you look at space times like Christopher Kleinman generated or things that other people um, that I looked at, for instance, so certain the alpha bar part has a well defined limit at null infinity in all these situations that are interesting. Other curvature components may not have limits, but there's depending on what you ask on your initial data, it, it, you get more or less structure out at null infinity. And so there's large classes of space times for which these things make sense. And we can, in, we have investigated many of them. I'm not going to go into detail. I just say the leading order part of the curvature has some well-defined limit that is related to, um, to radiation lately. Maybe I'll just skip that and jump, sorry, jump further here. So the alpha bar part shows up in the next maybe two slides in a moment. So if we do um, uh, gravitational wave experiments, right? So there is some limits of some shears that I showed you before at null infinity. And relations of the shears on the right hand side is related, that's just the delta x to some displacement in the data. So if I look at the data, there's some displacement of my test masses, and there's some curvature on the right hand side times um, a distance. So basically a Jacobi equation I have to solve. I have to integrate twice a Jacobi equation. So these shears at null infinity, there's a lot of information going into that simple little formula. I'm not gonna, I'm gonna skip that. But here, this um, tells you how much this, um, this is really the code to uh, read off something from the data that, the, that LIGO um, recorded already. And maybe just briefly, if we look at such an experiment, what's now the mathematical link between, linking between the experiment and geometry? So I look at the three geodesics. I have the Jacobi equation. Just here, I have the Jacobi equation, two derivatives on the left hand side, Riemann curvature uh, contracted with x. So this is nothing else but the Jacobi equation, right? So basically acceleration is related to curvature, etc. Now I integrate twice, but I take limits of this thing first at null infinity. And so here again, so if you have the Riemann curvature, there's wild curvature, and depending on what you have on the right hand side, you have other terms showing up or not. Now, if I jump here, so this is nothing else but the Jacobi equation, just written differently. And A is my alpha bar, the leading order part of the curvature is one over R part of the curvature. Now, I have two relations. So these are shears. So this curvature is related to the shear at null infinity through this very simple equation. It looks very different if you're locally sitting on the source, but it becomes very, very simple at null infinity. And we can show that for all these classes of space times, which are interesting, we have this relation. So I integrate once, use that relation, integrate another time, and use the second relation. That's between the two shears. And what I get is first up to some finite retarded time, I have here on the right hand side, again, the shears on the right, up, up at null infinity. And there's a lot of information that goes into that to tell you what's in there. But basically, this is exactly what LIGO has seen already. So there's a distance on the left hand side, and this is fed, this is fed by exactly what comes here from the, from the right hand side. And it's such a nice, simple looking equation. So you do all the information, all the work, I mean, with geometric analysis to look into these classes of space times to know what's here. So if we then, again, so if you then get, go and take the retarded time, so my u function has a limit. Sigma has a limit from minus infinity, when u goes to minus infinity, and to plus infinity, sigma minus and sigma u plus. So if I go the full distance, so this is then what encodes the memory effect, this permanent thing. That has not yet been seen, but we hope that they will see it uh, soon. And this thing, what goes into that is related to energy which is radiated away in the system. And if you don't have, so this T star is just anything in the, there's a specific component in the express energy tensor, but if that's not there, if that's zero, the Einstein vacuum equation, then we only have this first part, which is shear squared. That's pure, a pure geometric object, if you like. So in the Einstein vacuum case, we have only that part, and 
it feeds from other stress energy um, that could be around on the right hand side. Okay, so probably I skip this and just go up to the very end. So there's a lot of, let's say, beautiful geometry analysis uh, structure in the space times, and we try to look at, we want to look at classes of space times, which we can solve as a Cauchy initial valid problem for the Einstein equations. But then also we want to plug in large data and say something about this gravitational radiation that comes to us. As I said, I, there's a lot of structure uh, happening in these space times, but when you go up to null infinity, so the question, what survives? What do you know? How are the different patterns? And how can you use now this data in the future that we will see from LIGO and other experiments to say something about the students? And there's some, I think, beautiful connection about uh, between mathematics and really applied physics in that sense. So maybe I'll stop here. Thank you.